Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, or like a watch in the night. So teach us to count our days, that we may gain a wise heart. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, O God, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Let your work be manifest to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper us for the work of our hands. Let us pray together. Almighty God, who gives life to us and receives us back in death. We thank you for your abiding presence, grace, and love. In our frailty, we look to you for strength. And in our sorrow, we look to you for comfort. Help us in this hour to put our trust in thee that we may receive light and understanding and a new experience of thy grace unto eternal hope through Jesus Christ. May we say together, amen. My friends, we are gathered here to memorialize the life of a colleague, a mentor, teacher, and friend, Professor Francois Bovon. This is indeed a service of thanksgiving for his life, a life that was lived abundantly. Today we will hear the words of scripture to which Professor Bavon dedicated his life. We will hear remembrances from beloved colleagues and former students. And we will hear the music that he loved while sitting here in the pews of this church. Today's memorial service is being broadcast live on the web right now on the Harvard Divinity School website. And we welcome Professor Bovon's family and friends who are joining us in Switzerland. The order of the service is printed in your programs and we will proceed accordingly, beginning with the Dean of Harvard Divinity School, Professor David Hempton. Colleagues, friends, and guests, as Dean of Harvard Divinity School, it's my solemn privilege to welcome you uh, to the Memorial Church today, both to remember the life of our colleague and friend, Francois Beauvon, and also to celebrate the time that we were allowed to spend and work with him. I also want to extend a warm welcome to all of you watching the live cast who are sharing these moments with us. Especially, I want to welcome Monique Beauvoir, Francois's sister, his son, and all of Francois's family, his colleagues in Geneva, and his friends in Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us. Many of us have already had the opportunity to hear the very moving faculty minute that Karen King and David Hall presented on Monday at the faculty meeting of the Harvard Divinity School. It was an emotional, remembrance and very fitting remembrance of our dear colleague. When I think of Francois, the phrase gentleman scholar comes to mind, and yet that seems somehow insufficient. True, he combined manners, style, and European flair with hard work, immense learning, and the highest ideals of scholarship. But there's more to it than that. What made Francois so special as a colleague, mentor, teacher, and scholar was his kindness, his generosity of spirit, his gentle sense of humor, 
his unselfconscious humility and his profound sincerity in pursuing the search for the truth and wisdom in his work, especially in the Gospel of Luke. Francois was associated with HDS for two decades. He joined us in 1993, teaching New Testament and early Christian literature. And he was chair of the New Testament department twice. Prior to his arrival, Francois served at the University of Geneva in its Divinity School as a professor for 26 years and as dean from 1976 to 1979. He held the Frothingham Chair of the History of Religion and was an emeritus professor at the time of his passing. I first met Francois when I joined the Divinity School as a faculty member in 2007 and was immediately impressed with his immense learning and care for his students. Like many of you, I too enjoyed the special hospitality of Fairweather Street and the pleasure he found in giving pleasure to others. The last times I saw Francois at the American Academy of Religion Conference in Chicago and here in this church, he was obviously getting frailer and more vulnerable. But still fully on display were his unfailing courtesy, his transparent goodness, and even that characteristic twinkle in his eyes, mixed inevitably with sadness and pain. Much more will be said this afternoon about Francois's scholarly accomplishments by his longtime colleagues, friends, and former students. And we will all be witnesses to expressions of his lasting impact on HDS, the Harvard community, and the wider world. I want to thank everyone who helped organize this service, especially Karen King, Mikkel Beth Denkler, and Jonathan Walton and all participants as we celebrate and honor the life of our dear colleague and friend, Francois Beauvin. Gospel of Luke, chapter 20, verses 34 through 39. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in, th in that age 
and in the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die anymore, because they are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed in the story about the bush, where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now his God, not of the dead, but of the living, for to him all of them are alive. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well. In his commentary on the Gospel of Luke, our teacher, Francois Bavon, wrote of this passage. These verses transpose us, especially to another world, another time, that of the resurrection. It is great consolation for all who have lost a loved one, for all who suffer. For them, the continuing life of the deceased is rooted in God's being and not in an uncertain human survival attached to memories, merits, or even the immortality of the soul. In a picturesque and rigorous style, these verses speak emphatically both of the life of the resurrection and of the radiance of that age into the existence in this age. I speak to you today as one of Francois's students and then his colleague here at Harvard. I want to speak to you today about his personal and intellectual generosity and hospitality, about his generosity and hospitality in the face of being and remaining a bit of a stranger in a strange land. First, let me set some scenes of his intellectual generosity. My first publication was thanks to Francois a paper that I wrote in an advanced New Testament seminar, he used the opportunity of this seminar he offered on the topic of the apocryphal acts of the apostles to train his students not only how to be authors, but also how to edit a volume, how to be colleagues together working on a project. That intellectual generosity happened in the midst of his hospitality. I remember meetings on Fairweather Street where we perched on polite chairs in his living room glasses of wine in hand, and learn from him and from each other how to put together a volume of scholarship. And over more than a decade in that living room, dining room, and kitchen, we in the subfield of New Testament and early Christianity often gathered, and we welcomed visiting scholars. Francois would prepare a roast, delicious cheeses, and of course wine, and together with a smattering of dishes that colleagues and students brought, we would have a feast. He brought us together frequently, reminded us how to greet each other with a handshake and how to pause over wine and scholarship, how to tame our quick and brusque American ways. He lived here a bit as a stranger in a strange land. Over the Christmas holidays, at first I and then I and my children received many postcards from Francois, gracious and simple greetings. They were small, bright pictures that were windows onto a life in Switzerland and the Alps that he loved. I think he never fully adjusted maybe to life in the US, perhaps because the cultural contexts were so different. I remember sitting next to him at a community chapel at the Divinity School at the opening of term, in which then chaplain Claudia Heibau read from Horton Hears a Who and asked the community to participate in the refrain, a person's a person no matter how small. Throughout the service, I felt, or at least I thought I felt, Francois's polite bafflement, even as he participated. Walking out of Andover Hall, I asked him if he was familiar with Dr. Seuss. 
At first, he thought I was talking about a New Testament scholar <laughs> with a similar name. And then once he realized that I was talking about the author of the newly liturgical Horton Hears a Who, he kindly accepted my invitation to explain typical American children's books to him. I remember his graciously inviting me and my family, including my young children, to his home for brunch, an invitation really no one should have extended. Instead, we had him to our house, and he sat down to lunch with my chaotic family and my Lebanese father. Neither of them knew how quickly he was dying of cancer. They shared immigrant stories of Switzerland and Lebanon, of Francophone things of Christian practices in the Middle East. I remember once when Francois arrived at my friend's small apartment for an Easter brunch, largely attended by graduate students who were teetotaler evangelicals, American evangelicals, not Calvinists, in, that sen in his sense. To it, he brought a bottle of red wine that sat unopened but not unnoticed on the kitchen counter. Despite the culture shocks, and whether in private home or public chapel, Francois was generous and he participated, helping to form religious and scholarly community, feeling and creating connections to students and colleagues, even when that community proceeded in a way somewhat unfamiliar to him. Francois remained pastoral in his affect as a teacher while expecting no particular religiosity of his students. He paid attention. He knew that study was not merely an intellectual but also an affective pursuit, a calling that our minds and souls are wrapped up together in a pursuit of what we love. He was generous and hospitable that way, connecting family and feeling with collegiality. I have two signs of this for which I wish I had thanked him more. First, his appearance to my surprise at my son's midnight Easter baptism. And on my shelf of precious books, I have a gift he gave me after his son's suicide, Pierre Beaufort's novel, Le Joyeux Purgatoire. To close, I should take a verse from Francois's beloved Luke, but I, I turn instead to my beloved text, The Letters of Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes about death. He writes about human heaviness as we face our mortality, our life in this earthly tent, as he puts it. He talks about our longing that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, drunk down by life, absorbed by life, the Greek says. And Paul continues hinting at the promise of what this being swallowed up by life is. We are of good courage, he writes, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. As we mourn Francois's death, the warm conversations and the deep work of scholarship that's come to an end, I want to think of, to hope for, and to celebrate that at-homeness, that dwelling for our dear friend Francois. Francois and I met a decade before Francois joined the Harvard faculty. His superb work as the leader of the Geneva Lausanne team on a new critical edition of the Apocryphal Acts of the Apostles and my interest in advancing the standing of the Apocryphal Gospels turned out to make us natural allies in opening up a new field of inquiry into the history of ancient Christianity. So we became friends. When Francois finally joined the faculty of Harvard Divinity School, it enriched the life of many of us, but opened up especially for me two decades of close cooperation and companionship that was incredibly rewarding. As the editor of the English translation of Francois's masterful three-volume commentary on the Gospel of Luke, for the Hamaniah series, I became very closely acquainted with his scholarship. Francois was a scholar's scholar in the most distinguished tradition of erudition. 
He had researched and had read seemingly everything that was written about the Gospel of Luke from antiquity to the Middle Ages, to the Reformation, and to modern times, reporting lucidly about his findings and distinguishing fools from the wise without hurting anyone. He was thorough but gentle, both in his writings and in his personal relationship with colleagues and students. But he could also be forceful in taking a stand when he felt it was necessary. I want to tell you just one episode which I witnessed. It was at a meeting of the Societas Novi Testamenti Studiorum in Milan in Italy. Three days of papers and discussions had mostly been in English, some in German, none in French. But French is also one of the official three languages of the society. Towards the end of the meeting, another paper by a Swedish scholar was delivered in English again. François, uh, towards the end of the meeting, uh, François rose to respond to this Swedish paper. Speaking in English, however, he complained that the society had violated its constitution by not inviting a single lecture or respondent from, to use French as his or her language. And then he proceeded in French to give a brilliant criticism of the paper that had just been presented in English to make sure that French was spoken at least once during the meeting. François, dear colleague and friend, you have left us much before the time. And with your death, we are deprived of your wisdom, your erudition, your gentleness, and your kindness. And now, there is nothing but grief. When the sad news reached the Divinity School community of Francois's passing, and a few, have asked, few of us were asked in some haste to provide comments for the public announcement, one of the sentences I wrote reflexively was, Francois was a friend who happened to be a colleague. And it is Francois as a friend I want to recall at this moment how it was that our relationship passed from being one of colleagues to being one of being, to one of being friends is something I can't date. For if there was such a transition, and there must have been, it happened without effort or conscious intent. We shared an enjoyment of most things French, and I never tired of hearing him recall the trips to French cities and historic sites he went on as a boy or young man with his father. How much there must have been to learn and to share as these two exceptionally gifted men, father and son, walked around Dijon or Paris or the Roman ruins in Provence. How fully they must have realized how the past and the present in France, as well as in their home country, were intermingled. The classical world sustained and felt as living, not distant or discarded. And how much they must have felt, Francois in particular, 
but the Latin classic classics remained meaningful, and especially so if approached through the language in which they were written. When, as seemed to happen early on, he began leaving a steady drizzle of publications in my mailbox, I encountered the more adventuresome Francois and what he was doing, sometimes in association with Bertrand Bouvier and others, in recovering and interpreting an extraordinary array of Christian texts. For me, these essays evoked a single word in French, still much in use in everyday speech, impeccable, impeccable. If on the one hand they were terse and extremely specific, they were also something else, the stones out of which he was slowly constructing a larger narrative he did not live to complete. In effect, he invited me into that project, not in so many words, not by asking or making this explicit, but by acting on an unspoken assumption that friendship between two scholars means that each respects, appreciates, and enters into the life project of the other. For him, this assumption worked in both directions, as when nearing the moment he would return, when he would return to Switzerland, he said to me with a certain forcefulness that he would like a copy of my most recent book, which, as it happens, I gave him on the spot, and soon thereafter he read. For him, friendship encompassed so many other aspects of feeling or sensibility, one of them the joy of gift-giving. The flowers he brought Hannah each time he came for dinner, the wine he brought for the three of us to enjoy, or as Hannah remembers especially, the joy he visibly anticipated when he asked in his own special way if he could be a guest at our quite small-scale wedding. Joy expressed so openly is joy that presumes something akin to love and certainly presumes wholehearted trust. Francois was a person of joy and trustworthiness, and as all of you here know, trust is the rock on which friendship, on which friendship and joy must be based. With trust comes dependence, unspoken perhaps, but no less real for being unspoken. Francois took risks as a scholar. He took risks as a person of faith. But here this afternoon, the sorrow I feel comes from losing someone who dared make the transition from colleague to friend, who dared to invite me into his world, to show me that stoicism in the face of grief and illness does not mean giving up on joy, who reminded me of the wonderment of the past as approached through the scholar's vocation, who reached out to me as he reached out to others in love, and who exemplified the transition, who exemplified the transition from the formal vu in French to the intimacy of the two as a way of putting friendship first and all else second. Looking at the crowd coming to Francois's funeral in Geneva in November, I couldn't escape the impression that Francois was very much liked in his home country. The people who came to the funeral were by and large Swiss or other European colleagues and students. An outsider would not have guessed that Francois had worked on our side of the ocean 
for almost as long as he had in Switzerland. Looking at the church today, we could in fact make the same sort of observation. Francois literally lived fully in both worlds. Let me quote from a letter that just came from Francois's sister Monique, who flew over so many times when Francois needed help. She regrets very much not to be able to be with us today, but she went, uh, wanted to let us know how much Francois liked his life at Harvard. She wrote how happy he was to be with all the young students and how very hard it was for him to leave Boston and all his friends. We witnessed those happy years with great joy and pleasure and we saw the last period with great concern. I think that Harvard Divinity School showed itself at its best when Kimberly and Margaret, who always looks out for people in need, arranged a carpool, bringing Francois to and from the hospital for treatment. It was a brilliant solution, both logistically and psychologically. Not many people may know that besides Geneva and Cambridge, Francois had one other place where he regularly taught. That was in Rome at faculty of the Waldensians, the tiny Protestant minority in Italy. He had done so for many years, even before coming to Harvard, and dutiful and loyal as he was to his professional obligations, he continued this almost until the end of his life. We regularly met when Francois came to Rome, since my husband and I also spent time there. On one occasion, Francois, whose intellectual curiosity was always very active, heard from us that there was an exciting new excavation in the church of St. Paul outside the walls. A fourth century tomb had recently been discovered under the altar, and my husband had been involved in an aspect of its identification. Francois and some of his Waldensian colleagues arranged to meet the excavator, a curator at the Vatican and a friend of ours, who graciously gave the group a guided tour. On the way back, our friend, the curator, asked us who these people were. He had understood that they were theologians, but other than that, he was rather mystified. I tried to explain in my best Italian, which is not very good, that they were professors, some of whom famous, Protestants and Calvinists, upon which the curator responded, you mean they are heretics? <laughs> they might have been in the 12th century. But <laughs> I have never told this to Francois, but I'm sure that with his interest in Apocrypha, he would have endured this rather apocryphal story. The last time we met was in January last year in Rome. He insisted to take us out for lunch. His spirits were very strong, but his body was giving out. When we walked him to a cab, John and I had to support him on either side, and I had the impulse to put my arms around him and to protect him. He looked so very frail and I still don't understand what gave him the strength to travel all these distances and just march on. We miss our friend, we mourn our friend, but at the same time, we also should feel very privileged and blessed to have had him among us for so many years.
A reading of the Acts of Philip from the work of Francois Bavon. <clears throat> the last words of the Apostle Philip. Lord Jesus Christ, Father of the ages, King of light, you have made us wise by your wisdom and given your intelligence to us. You have granted us your grace and the counsel of your goodness. You have never been separated from us. You are the one who removes the disease of those who take refuge in you. You are the one who has given us the boldness of your wisdom, the one who has given us signs and wonders and has turned back those who were led astray. You are the one who crowns those who defeat the enemy. You are the good presider and prize giver at the contest. Come now, Jesus, and give me the eternal crown of victory over every hostile power and authority, and let now their dark air overshadow me, that I may pass through the waters of fire and all the abyss. Yes, my Lord Jesus Christ, let now the enemy have a place to accuse me before your tribunal. But clothe me with your glorious robe and bright seal that is always shining until I pass by all the world rulers and the evil dragon that opposes us. Now then, my Lord Jesus Christ, make me worthy to meet you in the air. Transform the form of my body in angelic glory and give me rest in your bliss. And I will receive what was promised from you, what you promised to your saints forever. Amen. And after Philip said these things, he gave up his spirit while all the crowds were looking at him and crying. So his life was brought to completion in peace. And everyone called out the Amen. Cher François, tu étais un ange parmi nous. Que les anges du firmament t'accueillent et te protègent maintenant et toujours. Ainsi soit-il. Amen. Francois passed away on my son's second birthday. It was an odd day for me. On a day when we were celebrating birth and beginnings, I was also experiencing the grief of goodbye. On a day of festivity, of family and friends and feasting, I was also saying farewell. For me on that day, hello and goodbye were strangely juxtaposed. But in a way, this juxtaposition seems oddly appropriate. Francois was always committed to feasting, to community, to celebration. Even over the past several years as he lost his health, his voice, his energy, he continued hosting parties in his home. He continued giving the scholarly world the fruits of his labor. He continued raising his glass of wine in a toast to life. I'd like to share just three moments in particular that profoundly influenced me. As we all know, one of the challenges of navigating the scholarly life is learning to deal with criticism, which can be quite harsh. Not here at Harvard, but elsewhere. <laughs> Once I sat in Francois's office particularly devastated by one such review of my work, he listened quietly, and after a pause, he said, I think you should hold on to your idea. He then proceeded to tell me kindly all of the many ways I could change, clarify, and adjust that idea. 
He was, after all, ruthlessly committed to logic, precision, clarity of thought. But his compassion that day carried me through later discouragements as well. The second snapshot is from when Francois retired. I was not finished with my degree yet, but he called me into his office to tell me that he was committed to staying with me through my graduation. Fully aware that not all senior scholars would have done so, I was thanking him when he leaned over mischievously and in a hushed voice, as though sharing a secret, he said, you should be glad I'm retired. Now I have all the time in the world just to critique your work. <laughs> The third event happened in 2012 when I was still writing my dissertation but living in Los Angeles. One day, Francois called to say that he had been hospitalized. He said, Michael Beth, your husband is a cardiologist. You know these things don't always turn out well. I may not leave this hospital, but I want you to know you will be all right. We strategized about my options if he were to pass away, and he finished by saying, I very much want to give you that hood on graduation. I will do my best. Thankfully, he did get out of the hospital, and he did hood me on this very stage that spring. I'm still amazed that Francois was selfless and thoughtful enough to call me when he literally thought he was on his deathbed. He thought of others in the midst of his own suffering. That's the kind of person he was. It's what makes it hard to say goodbye. The word goodbye used to be a blessing. It used to mean, God be with ye. Similarly, farewell means, I hope you fare well while we are apart. I imagine Francois leaving us, but with a blessing. God be with ye. May ye fare well while we are apart. And what comforts me is that I know this farewell is fleeting. Francois believed, and I believe, that this earth is not our final home. His goodbye to us was for him an entrance into the homeland of heaven, the eternal hello. I can picture him now feasting and celebrating in the presence of God, raising his glass in a toast to life. Francois was my mentor, my colleague, my friend uh, on various occasions when we were together and he was introducing to me to somebody I didn't know. He referred to me as uh, the person uh, for whom he uh, fulfilled his first official act at Harvard, my dissertation defense, uh, although I had known him prior to that point. Uh, on the other end of things, we spent about four years doing the English translation of the Acts of Philip, uh, I think just dragging it out because we enjoyed uh, the collaboration. Uh, but what I want to talk about for a couple of minutes is uh, another recurring experience that probably adds up to more time when all is said and done. Uh, you've heard about this already from the other speakers. Uh, this is wine and meals with friends. Um, many times uh, uh, we shared a table with Francois. Uh, Francois was a member of a wine tasting group, uh, including myself, my wife, uh, a number of other friends. Uh, the majority of the group were not scholars, uh, so we exposed Francois to a different type of America. And whenever we would communicate about these events, uh, either the wine tastings or other dinners, uh, there was a, always an email exchange. and. Francois, in his special way, would say, I am looking forward. Um, one of these occasions led to some strategizing about, you know, we should do this in Europe sometime. Uh, and we tried, particularly me, to convince Francois, you know, we have to go to Piedmont uh, and, and that area to taste uh, the Barolo and the Barbaresco. He, he wasn't so keen on this idea, uh, he said. His family always went to Tuscany. Uh, but we prevailed on him, and knowing what a generous spirit he is, he finally caved. 
um, and in the midst of uh, preparing uh, for a seminar that he was going to lead later for Harvard students in Milan, we managed to get him over to this area for a few days. So we're having a great meal in a restaurant, have a great bottle of wine, then Francois's research sense kicks in. Look at this bottle of wine. It's from this little town, Trezo. That's right nearby. Maybe we should go there. Uh, the next day, we pulled into Trezo. Town's about two blocks long. Uh, it's hot. Uh, there's a lot of people dressed up in tuxedos. Uh, there's evidently going to be a wedding. Uh, Francois says, look, there's the sign for Lodali. That was the producer of the wine. Let's go over and, and knock on the door. Uh, and then the language skills come into play because an 18-year-old adolescent comes to the door, uh, tries to find out what's going on. Francois immediately goes into Italian, lets him know we're here to taste wine. He yells up, Mama, cliente! Mrs. Lodali comes down. She's dressed for the wedding. She looks around. Oh, there'll be hours. Come out back. Two hours of wine tasting. Seven bottles of wine are open. I don't have food for you. I'm so sorry. Come back the next day. We're not fools, we came back. Uh, we ended up taking s several cases of wine from Mrs. Lodali, which we then began to drive up to Switzerland. Uh, I forgot an important uh, point of this story. Uh, uh, of the five of us who were there, uh, we didn't have enough cars to get down from Geneva, so Monique was kind enough to lend her car. Uh, Francois gave his car to Ron Cameron, and as we took off, I found out how much Francois liked to drive fast. And very quickly, we saw the other car, Francois's car, the small car, fading into the distance until it was completely lost. <laughs> how they ever found us, I don't know. Uh, so we're heading back into Switzerland, and now Francois's diplomatic skills are on display. This is before the European Union, one had to stop and explain, why is your trunk full of cases of wine? Oh, these are for my American friends. And there's a good cop, there's a bad cop. Francois, no surprise, uh, he prevails. Um, these are such great memories. It's, it's wonderful to hear that this evidently is an experience that Francois shared with many, many friends. So if, uh, as Christian hope avers, that profound absence yields to renewed presence, I am looking forward. Francois Bouvon was a teacher, scholar, and gentleman of many admirable and memorable qualities. I had the honor of co-teaching a seminar with him on three different occasions. In the classroom, he went about the business of imparting knowledge and encouraging inquiry with a sense of high purpose. His feelings of responsibility towards students ran deep, and this meant, in the first place, that he never came to class unprepared. Everything had been laid out according to an immediate as well as a longer term plan. He was always open, uh, this is not to suggest that he was rigid as a teacher, far from it. He was always open for discussion, gladly listened to questions, and was genuinely eager to explore alternative ideas. What he hated with a passion was wasting time. Chit chat and entertainment were not part of his instruction style. Those activities took place after class or in his guest-friendly home. For Francois, students were a sacred trust, and the relationships he developed with them long survived mere classroom encounters. Even the participants from outside the Divinity School, who happened to take a seminar with him, continued to hold his interest and concern for years afterwards. It was as if he felt privileged that they had decided to learn something under his guidance and with his support. Others uh, today already have spoken a little about Francois the scholar. I will recall briefly shared days and nights in his company in remote Greek Orthodox monasteries à la recherche des manuscrits perdus. 
Francois was tireless in the pursuit of sources fundamental to historical research, and along with his great good friend and collaborator, Bertrand Bouvier, he arranged several summertime trips to Mount Athos and Mount Sinai. Again, advance planning was the order of the day, and each outing was carried through with the same Boy Scout enthusiasm and discipline. Every minute was squeezed out of the limited and precious hours in the library, but after work time was given over to relaxation and fun to the extent possible in deserted locations and in monastic settings. Francois did know how to let his hair down within Swiss professorial limits, and reflecting perhaps the American side of his life, he readily set aside his tie and even wore jeans on informal occasions. In the evenings at our monastic lodgings, and at a safe distance from the hospitable monks, we played a Swiss card game, taken quite seriously by the Helvetii, it might be added. We ate cookies, and we sipped from carefully rationed cups of whiskey. All of this paraphernalia, needless to say, had been providentially included among the resources prepared for the expedition. Yes, Francois was indefatigable and a man of tremendous courage. Even several years into his final illness and in the face of daunting obstacles, he was still actively discussing another manuscript mission, this time to Jerusalem. Alas, he was forced to go on a different journey from which he was not to return. We all miss our friend and his generous and caring spirit. We are thankful for the ties of love that bind us together and for the contributions which Professor Bovon has left among those who loved him. Just before the benediction, let me invite everyone to join us right now for a reception at the faculty club. May we leave this place, yet remain in one another's presence finding comfort, compassion, and grace in friendship and in fellowship. May we look to the Lord together. All things are possible to those who believe, still more to those who hope, still more to those who love, yet most of all to those who practice all three. Now unto God who is able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before God's glory with exceedingly great joy. To the only wise God our Savior be honor, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forevermore. May we all say together, Amen. <laughs>